very good afternoon to everyone again. Thank you for joining us today. I am Shaida, Student Service Associate at Bishan Learning Center, and I will be your MC for this afternoon. Our Q&A session will be at the end of the talk for about 10 to 15 minutes. Our speakers from DAS Academy and our learning centers will be answering your questions live. If you are interested in our courses and workshops related to this talk, we will be featuring the upcoming courses and links will also be posted at the chat box. Without further ado, please enjoy the talk first and we will see you shortly. Hi everyone. Okay, I'm Yun Wei and I'm an Associate Lecturer with the DAS Academy and a Lead Tech Education Therapist with the DAS. So thank you for taking time out and having a lunch date with me as we talk about how we can get your child's attention. All right, okay, so uh, let's see. Okay, how many of you have found yourself asking these questions either to your child or yourself? All right, how many times must I repeat myself? And very often you find yourself uh, repeating like a broken record, you know, and your child does not seem to be able to remember what you've said. And in fact, you have to keep calling him to attention or uh, getting him back to the table when doing work. For example, you find that, hey, he, he can't focus on finishing his work. And very often, you find yourself asking, do you hear what I say? In fact, your child does not seem to register what you're saying. All right, so without further ado, let's look at the definition of attention. So the definition of attention is the ability to actively process specific information in the environment while tuning out other details. Okay, the thing about our attention is that it's limited in capacity and duration. As such, it is important for us to have ways to effectively manage the attentional resources we have available. So think about attention as a highlighter. So when you read through a section of text in a book, the highlighter section stands out, causing you to focus your interest in that area. So it's not just about centering your focus on one particular thing. All right, it also involves ignoring a great deal of competing information and stimuli. So attention allows you to tune out information sensation and perception that are not relevant at the moment. And instead, it focuses your energy on the information that's important. All right, in fact, there are actually four types of attention. Firstly, we have the sustained attention. In other words, you are able to hold and maintain attention over a period of time, uh, necessary for the focus and concentration needed in learning, listening and paying attention during conversation or instruction. Just like now, for you to listen to me for the next 20 minutes, you will need to have sustained attention for you to get the, the most out of it. All right, next, we have selective attention. In other words, we pay attention to specific input uh, by, the, by the brain's ability to select the input we pay attention to. So consciously and unconsciously, we are able to select the input which is most important. Okay, later, we'll do a short test on, a selective, on selective attention. All right, to help you better understand this idea. All right, and selective attention is also important when it comes to reading, okay, because um, then you will be able to pick out the main ideas and summarize. And um, of course, when you do your work, it also helps you to focus on the work that you are doing. Okay, and then we have alternating attention. Okay, this is important when you are uh, switching tasks, you're moving from one activity to another. Okay, um, yeah. So switching points of concentration is needed to make sudden switches in alternating attention in tasks which require different cognitive skills. So for example, um, uh, your, your child could be working on a math task and then um, your child would require alternating attention to then be able to switch to, for example, a Chinese task or, or to go and do his homework and, or to, to go and have dinner. All right, and lastly is divided attention. Okay, the divided, divided attention is basically the ability to focus on two or more things at the same time. Okay, if you are, so I think a very la, real life situation that we see people doing is that being able to drive and hold a conversation simultaneously. All right, um, but not all of our, our children have the ability to have divided attention. Um, some of them can only focus on one thing at a time. Okay, so now let's do a quick test on uh, selective attention. Let's take a look at this video. Okay, so see if you can count how many times they were throwing the ball.
All right. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed the video. Okay, so of course, I'm sure you guys will have counted the number of times they were throwing the ball correctly, the number of times they were jumping correctly. But how many of us really saw the toilet, the toilet stall changing from blue to green? And how many of us saw the basketball net disappearing? Okay, very often, um, that's the truth about our attention. It's always on something. And that's what we call selective attention. Because I gave you a question, I prime you to look at a certain thing. So you were just focusing on what I wanted you to see. All right, but, very, but the reverse is also true. Very often when we think that our child is not listening, um, is not paying attention. In fact, it, in fact, it's just something else captivating their attention. So when we select attention, um, so we also need, need to teach them how to um, practice selective attention. Okay, so uh, with that understanding about attention, okay, I'm going to share with you guys very quickly about four strategies that you can do um, to help your child with their attention, especially in the area of doing their work. All right, so first thing is that we need to get their attention. Okay, how many of you or how many of us um, after working, as we get back home, what we find ourselves is shouting their names down the corridor. June, get your work done. You know, come and do your homework. Go and wash your hands. And, and the thing is that we, do, we, we have no idea where they are in the house. All right. And sometimes, they, and sometimes, and why it's even best, better is that they will just, okay, yes, mommy. And then you don't see them coming to do what they're supposed to do. All right. In fact, um, that is a very, very common um, phenomenon that, that we see happening to kids. So the very first thing that um, to get their attention, especially if you find that your child is not um, able to pay attention or, or struggles with listening, the first thing you need to do is to establish eye contact. So establish eye contact. So make sure your child looks at you before you start giving instructions. Okay, very often um, in our modern day time, especially with this COVID situation, working from home, very often we'll, we'll be using our phone and then we are like talking to our kid and expecting our kid to um, respond to us but probably we should put away our devices, look at them in the eye, and then um, make sure that your child is looking back at you before you give the instructions. So at least you know that their eyes are on you, okay? Um, their selective attention is on you, so there are no other distractions that are, there, there are no other distractions that are fighting for the attention, okay? And secondly, physical contact could help establish attention. So not all children are very visual or auditory. So sometimes some kids are more kinesthetic, they are more physical. Right, so sometimes you just need to tap them on the shoulder, all right, or just hold his hand, or even look at him in the eye and wait for him to look back at you before you give your instructions, okay? And then you could just start your sentence with, I have something to tell you, all right? And that, and that is a cue for them to, okay, mommy has something to tell, daddy has something to tell me, and then I'll begin to look at mommy or daddy, all right? And in fact, um, you could also consider using single words instruction. So for example, um. Tom, do your homework. Instead, just say Tom, homework, right? So, so, so they will not. Um, so they will be able to focus on what it, you want them to really listen to. So, using single words can be a very powerful strategy. Uh, can be a very powerful strategy in your communication as well. All right, and very importantly, end off with Can you repeat what I just told you? Especially if you realize that your whatever that you've told your child to do, very often what what they do is different from your expectation then I guess um, this is a very effective way. You ask them, can you repeat what I just told you? Get them to paraphrase, right? And when they are able to articulate, it means that they have listened, they have processed it, and it has gone into their short-term memory, okay? So I'm just going to show you very quickly uh, an information processing model, okay? So right here, we're talking about sensory memory, right? So when they're listening, uh, when they're hearing, when they're looking, and when they're touching, they get the information. But if they are not paying attention to it, right? So this is where attention comes in. So if they do not pay attention to it, um, then it will affect the memory because um, if they're not paying attention, it does not go into their memory. So without attention, there will be no learning. So hence, getting attention is a very, very important strategy okay, before you can start on any form of learning or communication. All right, so, um, so moving along, all right, let's talk about attention span. Okay, scientific studies tells us that a typical child has an attention span between two to five minutes per year of life. Okay, if you can type in the chat box or, or just put it out there, okay, so that we know that you are, you are processing the information. All right, you can put it on the chat box or you can put it on the Q&A. All right, um, how, so uh, what is the typical attention span expected of your child? So for example, if my child is nine years old, 
right? Then I would expect nine times two. So my child will have about 18 minutes to five times nine to 45 minutes. Okay, that's a very big span. All right, but that's acceptable. So that tells you what is the typical attention span expected of the child. Okay, so yes, write it down somewhere so that you, you know what you can focus on. Okay, so take the age, the year, okay, multiply it by two and then multiply it by five. So that is the range that you get for the attention span of your child. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mint. I see your response. Okay. So I figure that your child is about is uh, seven years old. Right. Okay. All right. Okay. So with that in mind, that comes the strategy number two. Okay. Work with that attention span. All right. Of course, um, what you've calculated is the expected, but we must also know that every child is different. That's why that's a range. Okay, so for example, uh, for Mint, her child would be working from 14 to 35 minutes, right? Um, and and, and that, is, uh, that is a target that you could work towards, okay? That you can work towards when working with your child, all right? So alternatively, what you can do is that you can observe how long they can stay working on a task and pack to it too. So for example, um, I'm just going to use Mint's child since she responded to me. All right, so, so for example, Mint, uh, her child, uh, can work on her math homework for maybe 15 minutes, okay? And, 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 and it's not distracted, does not ask for toilet break and things like that. So that is attention span that she can work with. And then she can break down tasks um, to 15 minutes. So before giving the child an attention break, right? So that means probably uh, finish three questions, okay, in 15 minutes, and then you can go for a two minutes break and then come back and continue again. All right, but then again, um, let's be mindful that this could vary across different subject matters. Okay, because of perceived difficulty too. It might not be very difficult, but to the child, maybe they find that it's more difficult or they do not enjoy the subject as much. All right, um, then their attention span on the task could be shorter. So I have seen children that they could find, they could, they could be working on math, math uh, homework for half an hour, but for Chinese after five, 10 minutes, um, they find that they want to go for a break. So it could vary based on subjects as well. So uh, you've got to observe and tailor it according to your child. All right. And then, um, yeah, all right, so what you could do is, okay, so you could also um, create checklists, right? Um, yeah, you could also create checklists so that they could actually see where they are going for and then what they can, uh, and help them to stay focused on the task on hand, okay? And uh, very importantly, we need to grow our child's attention span. After all, um, if they're going for examinations, the duration of attention is a lot longer, right? So uh, how can we grow their attention span? So for, so, for example, if the child can only focus 15 minutes, then probably you could increase that to maybe 18 minutes, 20 minutes, then give a, a movement break and continue. And then um, continue working on that increased attention span. So continue working on, in 18 or 20 minutes block until the child can, is comfortably working with 18, 20 minutes block before you increase that. Okay, so keep repeating it until your child gets comfortable. So increase the duration gradually. Um, yeah, so if they are only if they can only stay focused for five minutes, then probably you can only increase the duration by one or two minutes each time. But if they're focusing like um 20 minutes, then maybe you can consider increasing it by three to five minutes each time. Okay, so the key here is to be consistent until it gets um comfortable. All right. Okay, so uh when working with attention span, I think something else we need to pay attention to is that we need to deal with attention teeth. Okay, we need to deal with um Attention thief. Okay, so a notorious attention thief in modern day is technology, such as our iPads. So while technology has been useful, it has also affected our attention. So the average attention span of a human in 2000 will be about 12 seconds. All right. And then, uh, but we're able to come back to the task, right? That's when we talk about sustained attention. All right. Uh, but the average attention span of a human now is eight seconds. All right. And that is um, even lesser than the goldfish. Okay, uh, so people now generally lose concentration after eight seconds, highlighting, and that highlights the effects of an increasingly digitalized lifestyle on the brain. We constantly need to be stimulated, like swiping up the Instagram, etc. Okay, so uh, Microsoft, who did the study, theorized that the changes was a result of the brain's ability to adapt and change itself over time. And a weaker attention may be a side effect of evolving to a mobile internet. So if you, have, if you have younger kids at home, do moderate the screen time as much as possible and get them to focus on real world play. Okay, and that helps in developing attention. Okay, that helps. Okay, real world play helps in developing attention. All 
right? And strategy number three, okay, is to change the environment, okay? Um, sometimes we feel that we want to have, especially uh, where our children sit to do their homework, we try to make everything accessible to them, okay? But not every child can manage that. Okay, so if you if find that your child is always fiddling with things and there are, and there are blocks that they would want to try to play with um, on their homework table, then make sure that the working table only has the essential so that there are no toys, etc., to take away their attention from the task. All right, so remove possible distractions. And you have more than one child, okay, try to ensure that the homework time of one does not coincide with the play time of the other. Okay, so um, if, the, uh, if your younger child has no homework, then probably make it a reading time or something. All right, because playtime is what all children enjoy, right? And, and, the, and you do not want to be in a power struggle where how come Mimi, Titi can play and then I cannot, I must do work, okay? So try to um, try not to have a homework time and playtime coinciding together, all right? And it also helps um, to have a homework spot so it mentally shifts their attention to the task at hand. When they come to a place, instinctively, um, they know that they need to do homework. So that helps, okay? It can just be a table, with their pens, all right? And, and they know that that's a homework spot. Okay, next, um, for some children, um, they do not enjoy homework as much. So providing visual timetable also helps the child to know what's coming up next. So that helps with their alternating attention. It helps them to mentally change gears. So it prepares them for the next task, all right? And, and if they do not enjoy the particular task they are doing, at least they know that there's an end to it, okay? It does not uh, go into eternity. All right, and it can help them to focus, okay? And uh, lastly, you could consider using a visual timer such as the one shown on the slide. Okay, what happens is that um, learners with learning difficulties or younger children, they have a poorer concept of time. Okay, uh, time is very subjective. It's not so concrete. In fact, uh, one minute doing homework could feel like eternity, right? And one minute playing then feels just like a second. So having a visual timer helps to concret concretize time so that they have a clearer idea of how much time has gone by and how much time is left for them to focus. So over time, um, it also helps them to develop focus and um, a better concept of time. Okay, and lastly, um, consider considering or modifying the task. Okay, so as much as possible, give very specific and clear instructions. Okay, many of you probably have seen this math question before, and this happened because of the ambiguity of the term fine. Fine is look for it. Right. Um, so in fact, the question could have been find the value of x. So where possible, um, include include visuals. Um, and if there are more than two steps involved, okay, consider giving them visuals. So for example, if you want them to um to pay first and then do their homework, then write them down so that they can see and they can track. Okay, and it can even be the form of checklist. So it helps them to it helps to bring that attention when they forget. So the thing is that uh our we can always pay attention to something, but our attention can switch off. So having a visual checklist helps them to bring back attention, helps them to have sustained attention. Okay. And next, um, children tend to learn better to play and when all their senses are engaged. So as much as possible, okay, getting them to hear, getting them here to see, to touch and move actually helps with their memory a lot more. So in fact, there's a lot about authentic learning experiences, getting them to move around the house. All right, and you can engage all their senses as much as po uh, possible with slight task modification. So let's take a look at how we can change um, the format of task. Okay, so for example, um, for spelling. So when learning spelling outside words, you can set up post it around the house and your child is supposed to search for it and then copy it. Okay, so that means like um, they're supposed to learn ambulance for spelling. So, so they're supposed to look for it and then to write it. So um, and usually this post it could be uh, around um, in the, around the walls on the, in the house, and then they can just copy and write it down. All right, um, yeah, so, so it helps them to build their reach uh, ability as well. All right, and it makes tasks more fun. All right, and then um, you could also consider giving them um, sentries. So uh, like, for example, this sentry, what, what we did was to, to use, uh, seven di use different colors to create a rainbow. So when they write, they see different colors appearing. Um, in fact, if you have expired rice or you have chickpeas, you can use any of it and then create a tray. So it becomes a very sensory experience for them. Okay. And then um, something that uh, I got a friend to try with her kid, her, her, her six-year-old kid. Okay. I think with, if you have a six-year-old child, um, the most intimidating thing is to prepare for spelling and things here uh, for, 
to prepare them for primary school. So what you could actually do is that you could actually um, write out the words for their spelling on King Tian. Uh, in fact, math problems, you could put it in and then um, it will be like a lucky draw. They'll draw it out and they could read the word first, all right, on the first time. And then on the second time, um, then you could be, they could test you on the word on how to write and then you could test them back as well. So um, yeah, so it, it makes learning more fun and engaging for them, right? So time tends to pass by more quickly and uh, it helps them to stay focused on hand as well. All right, and for math problems, um, sometimes you don't need they do not need to do it one by one, but they could. Uh, you could mix up the order. So you could also put in math question and for them to draw it out and then write it out. Okay. Um, and then of course for math questions, um, you could. Okay, not just for math, but for any other questions, you could also considering changing the format. So um, getting them to first work on a rough piece of paper, right? Uh, a lot of our worksheets now actually have many questions. But what happens when you have many questions on a piece of worksheet? it doesn't help them to focus because it, it feels very cluttered, right? Um, it doesn't draw their attention to that specific problem. And it can be very scary or intimidating because there's not much working space on it. So in fact, when you actually um, write out, uh, rewrite the questions on an A4 paper, all right, or on a major paper and paste it on your wall, it actually uh, engages them. Okay, so naturally it deals with the attention bit because um, it is more fun. All right, um, and, I and I know we are all busy. Is busy parents, all right? Many of you are very, very busy and, and you find that, hey, this takes up too much time. But I want to encourage you today, you know, give it a try, you know, and, and more likely than not, you will probably find yourself achieving more with your child in lesser time. And, and with that, you are actually also developing the attention. Okay? Um, and in fact, um, you could also make use of technology, especially for science subjects. Um, you could watch for summary videos. Uh, when learning multiplication tables, you could look for songs that help them to remember the multiplication table rather than just rote memory. So you can just look for multiplication songs. Okay, you'll find plenty of them. Okay, find one that captures the attention of a child and that engages them. All right, so in summary, the four strategies I've shared with you today is number one, get their attention. Okay, you can do that by establish, establishing eye contact, touch them physically, get their attention. Secondly, work with that attention span. Okay, know how much, if they are, observe how long they can stay on a task and then build, build their attention span from there. Thirdly, change the environment. Make it clean, um, not cluttered, right? And then take away distractions. And number four, modify the task. Uh, make the task more fun and engaging for your child. So I would encourage, since you have invested three minutes of your time with me, you know, I will encourage you to pick one or two of the strategies and do it consistently. So you might find that eh, the results are not showing, but can I tell you that it will take a while to relearn certain habits. In fact, it takes three weeks for a new habit to form and another, another three weeks to make it permanent. So um, yeah, so, so I hope that the sharing is useful for you to, that you, you have one or two takeaway for you to work on um, with your child to develop their attention and to help them to focus on their task on hand even more. All right, so with that, thank you. Yeah, so thank you once again for your time um, and feel free to add comments on what you may have found useful or if you have any questions relating to getting your child's attention, I'll be happy to answer them. All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone, and I hope you all had a fruitful understanding from the session. Before we start the Q&A session, we would like to hear from you as we value your feedback. On your screen, we have shared the QR code for our feedback form as well as links to other DAS sites for your reference. Please spare a minute or two to complete the feedback form for us. We will be sharing on our upcoming courses by DAS Academy, in which we will stay back later to answer your queries if you are interested to sign up for these courses. Now we shall move on to our Q&A session, which will approximately take 10 to 15 minutes. You may ask questions relevant to the session, which we will do our best to answer. We have our speaker, Ms. Kong Yun Rei, Lead Educational Therapist at DAS and Associate Lecturer of DAS Academy. Besides teaching, Ms. Yun Rei does research on learning difficulties in Chinese. She also develops curriculum and mentors teachers at DAS. 
Ms. Yunre will help to address educational questions and I will also help with queries pertaining to our learning centers. So uh, let's begin. Okay. Hi. Uh, there's actually a very interesting uh, question in the uh, Q&A uh, box. Uh, it's, do you agree with having a child holding on to a fidget uh, toy uh, during like schoolwork to help keep his or her attention? What do you think? Yeah, okay, so actually for fidget toys, right, I, I think it's perfectly fine. I've seen kids that really could stay focused on the work they're supposed to do uh, with a fidget toy. And sometimes it's not even a fidget toy, it's blue tech, right? They just need something uh, around, right? Uh, even in um, SS school in Hawaii, what happens is that they actually have, um, they have rubber bands, something like, okay, they have elastic bands tied to the, to the chair. So uh, for kids to bounce off, to bounce their feet while they're doing their work. All right, so um, I, I think generally it's okay. Okay, the rule of the thumb is basically it does not take attention away from the task. So if you get, if your child has a fidget toy, right, and then the attention is on the fidget toy and the child is not able to listen to what you are doing, uh, it's not able to focus on doing their work, then um, that fidget toy is a distraction. It's not, it does not help in building attention. So if, yeah, so if the toy helps, um, helps the child to sustain attention, then um, that's perfectly fine. Very, very interesting. Yeah, okay. So there's a question that if a child falls out of the formula, right? So so the, the formula was um the number of years multiplied by two or five, right? That's the range. Okay, um, if the child falls out of the formula, it does not mean that the child has attention deficit disorder because attention um is something that that takes time to build, right? Um and and sometimes it's because they have not been trained to have attention to, to focus on something, right? And then um yeah, so because they have not been trained to focus on something, so they might not be able to, to have that attention on some, uh, to pay attention for that duration of time. So uh, the diagnosis, you still need to get a professional advice, right? But if you have, a, if you have concerns, um, I would suggest you could try out some of the strategies that I've shared with you, right? You could change the activity, uh, moderate screen time. And if you still have concerns after working um, on these strategies with your child, then go and get professional help, right? Go and get... Um, and seek uh, advice if you have concern about your child's ability to stay focused and to concentrate. All right. Okay. And then I think just to build along, uh, okay, so the, the, there's a few questions that also that's asking, okay, so if the attention span is this short, then how can they focus on examination? Right. Okay. So then that goes back to, um, so that goes back to um, this thing called sustained attention. So that, that range that you've come up with. So if a nine-year-old, you'll be 18 to 45 minutes, right? So with that range, what happens is that um, they will lose attention, but they, they must be able to come back to the task again. So when, when it comes to sustained attention, then that is um, that is what is required during examination, right? So uh, for them, so what you could do is that you uh, exam strategies then come in very importantly. So when they feel tired, so a strategy that could help them is to ask them to drink water. But be very mindful, drinking water is maybe just take a seat, take a gulp, and then take a break so that they can refocus their attention on the work on hand. All right. Um, yeah, I have students that 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 got very um that took the water drinking to an extreme end. So they drink a lot of water and ends up um he has to go to the toilet during examinations and that take away examination time. So just be very mindful, whatever strategy that is used, uh, use it in moderation, right? Um, so for exams, right, it's very important to help them to come up with strategies that help them to refocus. Um, generally, you and I, we can't focus for very long as well. But what happens is that we usually, we can, we can walk to the pantry, you know, and, and we do something to help us to come back and refocus. So that, uh, strategies is, that strategy is also very important uh, for them, okay? Does these uh, strategies uh, uh, applicable for children with learning issue, issues like attention deficit or hyperactive, will it uh, help as well? Okay, yeah, so it does. Um, in fact, another attention strategy that you can do is, uh, give me a moment. Okay, so for example, right, that if there is, um, if there is five pages in the, exam, right? You could get them to draw a pentagon. Okay, sorry. Um, okay. Okay. So for example, in the exam, if there's four parts of the question that you need to answer, so each time they finish one, then they can draw a... Uh, okay, so 
four parts is square, right? So each time they finish, they can draw. Yeah, they can just draw one aspect of it, like just one part of the shape to help them to, as a mental break, and also help them to focus that, okay, I've done one part, then the second part, the third part, and the fourth part. So this also ensures that they will not miss out on pages as well. If there's four parts, right? So you could, okay, after they finish the first part, they could draw a line, right? Then after that, the, then they finish the second part of the paper, and the third part of the paper, and then the fourth part of the paper. So when, when they know that they have a, they, when they complete the shape, then they know that they have, they, they have finished the, 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 the entire paper. So actually you can also look at um, one of the articles that we have published on our blog, okay, um, making use of exam time, right? Um, that is on our DAS Academy website. So that's a very useful reading that you can read up uh, for use with a child, um, especially um, helping them to tackle exams. So examinations to help our children, especially a learner with difficult learning difficulty to tackle examinations, is actually a very different skill set that you need to be on. So I think today what I've covered mainly is on learning, right? But then for examinations, then there's another whole, there's another um, set of skills that we need to uh, build in for our children. Okay. Okay, uh, there's this question. Uh, how much time to restrict for screen time or remove device completely? How much time for screen time? Okay, I, I think it is useful for uh, you to draft up a policy with your child, right? Um, especially um, if, you, if they've been having unlimited screen time, then I think it's very important. Um, I, I think that number can negotiate, but as much as possible, kids below seven, they should have very, very little screen time. Um, in fact, 10 minutes a day uh, for very young kids, then maybe a nine-year-old about 30 minutes. Okay, so uh, yes. Okay, I, I think I also just want to address on how attention span can be uh, increased. Okay, very much it is by building blocks. Uh, but yeah, so, so by working with a specific duration of time and then you time them so that they are used to it. So I think our brain has a way of getting used to, 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 uh, to this kind of habit. All right, and then another way uh, is by, by changing the format of tasks. So they, they learn to work on tasks for a certain period of time until they are done with it. Okay, and that is very important, okay, uh, as, as they go along. Okay, so uh, when, you, when you give them blocks, right, when you get, uh, like, so for example, the child's attention is 15 minutes, and you want to increase it to 20 minutes. So you, you increase it to 20 minutes, then give a two, maybe a two to, two to five minutes break. Right? During that break time, um, they could use it to go to the toilet, or they could uh, do something that they like, all right? Um, it can even be uh, doing cross-body exercises, okay? That's what brain gym perpetuates, okay? That means, um, that means um, you know, your hand, your, your right hand, your left knee, and then the other way, or getting them to do jumping jack, some form of exercise, uh, something that they enjoy, uh, so that they are not so resistant to come back to the next block of being in. Yeah, that will be helpful. So, so basically, it could be uh, physical, so that it gets the brain going, um, getting them to hydrate is very important as well. All right, and uh, mo and very importantly, it's something that they enjoy doing. Okay. Uh, Yunre, there is mm. this question: uh, Is coffee or tea helpful in improving focus with kids with ADHD? Okay. Uh, actually, caffeine is not good for any one of us. Actually, <laughs> yeah. So coffee and tea are. Uh, Basically, I'll ask them to choose me, right? Okay, I mean, basically choose the parent. Okay, and, and, and as a parent, we can help them to build, build their, their focus, their attention. Uh, very often, sometimes they, they just need some skills and strategies to help them. Okay, so earlier on, uh, a parent has pointed out fidget toy. All right, or you can just actually change the nature of the task, right? Um, so, okay, sometimes um, kids may not be paying attention, but simply because they are actually task avoidant because they find that it's so difficult for them and they do not want to do it. So they are trying to get out of it. So it's not that they cannot pay attention, but because uh, what, this is what I call task avoidant behavior, they find it so hard. Um, they find that the task is so hard. So they are just trying to find ways to get out of it. So it's not so much of an attention issue, but more of a task avoidant issue. So you could try changing the format of task um, and make learning more fun for your child. Okay, and, and as you go along, right? Uh, okay, and... I think another question is about the child needing to go to the washroom very frequently. It might not really be a difficulty with paying attention. Okay, I had, I had a 13 year old boy that came to me. Within one hour class, okay, uh, he actually had to go to the toilet five times. Okay, and, and 
what is really the issue? The, the issue is that he was very nervous. He was very stressed out. So, uh, and, and the, the way he coped is that he drank water, right? And he just ne needed to keep going. And I couldn't deny him of that, right? But what I did to help him was to uh, get him to resolve it. Okay, first go to the toilet before the class, right? And then when you drink water, drink it instead. All right, and then I limited the number of times. So it started with, okay, you can only have four toilet breaks. So I wrote it on the board. So I clean it up each time. So he knows he needs to pace it. And gradually I decreased it. And then eventually it began to decrease to zero. Yeah. So he did not, he only went to class, he only went to the toilet before and after. So a lot of things, it may look like attention, but I think you need to dig deeper um, to, to understand is it because they find it too difficult or they find that it's very stressful for them. Yeah. All right. There is, uh, this, uh, there is this question uh, how can we use positive discipline when dealing with students with ADHD? Do we use positive discipline when dealing with students, dealing with, students with ADHD? ADHD. Okay. Simply is just encourage them when they're doing the right behavior. Um, I think with the strategies that I've shared, uh, where, where you, where you, when, you, um, when you tailor that learning to your child and when you begin to catch them while doing good. You know, for ADHD students, they are very used to, why are you not paying attention? Can you focus? Can you listen? Um, yeah, why can't you quickly finish your work? You know, today they are just very used to being um, questioned, right? And, and um, But when you are able to, to break down the task to their attention span, all right? And then, or you could be changing a format and say, and you encourage them. Okay, you've persevered. You've done that question, right? Uh, you persevered through the question. Okay, well done. Um, I see you trying to put in a lot of effort. And then when, you and when they begin to feel that, hey, I can finish a question within that, I can, I can focus and finish that question. Then that encourages them to keep on going on. So um, that, it, that, comes from that comes from modifying the task. Okay, and, and that, and also that, uh, and also with you verbalizing um, that appropriate behavior, then uh, with you focusing on that positive behavior, that helps them to build that attention as well. Yeah. There is this question, uh, can the above strategies be used in a larger group setting, like in a classroom? Yeah, okay, so visual, okay, for example, um, okay, the, 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 the strategies definitely needs to be adapted. So, for example, the visual time table is actually used in a lot of our DAS classrooms because that helps our kids to stay focused, okay? And by ticking off, um, they know that they are coming to an end, especially when approaching a very difficult task such as reading, comprehension, and writing. All right, so uh, it can be applied to, to a bigger classroom setting, definitely. Okay, yeah, and uh, movement breaks does help. Um, and, okay, and of course, I think with the classroom, we talk about modification of the environment. Like what I shared earlier on, um, there are schools in Hawaii. What what there are schools in the in the states. What they do is that they can give them uh, they give them the wobbly cushion, right? They even have um chairs that is that there's just one leg. There's just one leg. Okay, so the child has to stay focused. That helps them to keep focused during class. Or even having elastic band around the legs of the chair helps the kids to stay focused as well. So there are modifications that you could consider. Um, adapting into your classroom as well. And uh, okay, that I see that there are quite a number of questions. Uh, yes. So basically, I think the general, okay, let me just deal with, uh, with um, recommended phone time and iPad time. So um, basically what you could do is that you could limit, demarcate the time. So basically what time to check. So uh, yeah, you just need to arrange with them. And at the same time, uh, so basically it could be that after school, they're they are allowed to check it once. And then after that, um, uh, like maybe at 7, 8 p.m., they, they are allowed to check it again um, with, with regard to the schoolwork. All right, so usually it's not ongoing information. I, I, don't, I don't think that's happening in the school setting as well. So I, I think they market certain pockets of time uh, so that they know when and to expect and what to expect, then that, that is very useful. All right, and with the use of technology, um, it's very hard to change a child without changing ourselves. So uh, it's also important that if you tell them that, okay, uh, during this period of time, uh, it's family time, there's no phone, then I think as parents, we also got to put away uh, our phones as well. Okay, yeah. Okay, then for the elastic bands around the chair, uh, the bands are actually tied around the legs of the chair. Okay, it's just around the legs of the chair. All right, yeah.
Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. We are reaching the end of our Q&A session and we'll be wrapping up the last few questions from you. If you are unable to answer some of your questions live, please send it through our feedback form via the QR code shared here or to the link shared in the chat feature. We will be collating all the questions and we will get back to you via email. So uh, let's take in the last few uh, questions. Yeah? Uh, Yun Rui, uh, will yoga ball help the kids instead of rocking his chair? It depends. It really depends. Yeah. So I, so I guess what works for your child might not work for another child. But uh, I think yoga ball does help them in, in a sense of balance. Um, and I think when you divert their attention, okay, in fact, the, the schools in the state, some of them actually give the, the children yoga balls to sit on rather than a chair, right? Because um, it's less dangerous in a sense. Okay, thank you everyone for attending this talk and being such wonderful participants. The next webinar, Learn to Write with the Right Approach, will be on 1st July, Thursday. You may go to our website to find more details about this webinar. The DAS Academy has courses that are relevant to this webinar, and the links are posted in the chat box. You may also visit the DAS Academy website for our other courses, but due to the time limit, we'll only share three here. The first course is Clever But Cluttered, Developing Your Child's Executive Function Workshop. This workshop will be conducted on 8 May 2021. This workshop is targeted at parents and teachers who are interested in helping learners with specific learning difficulties, also known as SPLD, to become more effective in managing the studies. SPLD learners tend to struggle more with schoolwork due to the nature of their learning needs. The, the registration for this workshop closes on 5th May 2021. The second course is Going Beyond Learning Difficulties, Developing Growth Mindsets Workshop. This workshop will be conducted on 5th June 2021. The participants will learn practical strategies to talk to their children about their learning difficulty and challenges and how to manage them. Participants are also guided on how to develop a growth mindset in their children by learning how to praise, frame questions, and offer controlled choices to them in their daily living. Registration for this workshop closes on 1st June 2021. The third course is the Certificate in Educational Psychology, which will be conduct conducted from 23rd to 30th October 2021. This course aims to equip participants with an understanding of educational psychology and its impact on parenting, teaching, and learning styles. Participants will gain deeper understanding of the importance of educational psychology in teaching and learning, and that no single learning approach or style will fit every learner with SPLDs. Registration for this course will close on 20th October 2021. With all these exciting courses that DAS Academy has to offer, do post in the Q&A feature any questions that you would like us to address. If you are unsure about how to sign up or you would like us to explain more about the courses we have shared earlier. While we are waiting for your response, we would like to share how you can get some grants and discounts from, for some of these courses. If you are practitioners in the field of specific learning differences and education, we could encourage you to join VITA, which stands for Register of Educational Therapies Asia, an initiative by the DAS to bring together SPLD practitioners. Teachers and allied educators can certainly qualify to be a VITA member. However, the good news is that you don't necessarily have to be a practitioner to be a VITA member. There are different levels of membership. Regardless of the membership level, RITA members get to enjoy a 10% discount on courses and workshops conducted by the DAS Academy. To find out more about RITA, you may visit www.rita.sg. Next, we also like to share about the CTG, which is short for Caregivers Training Grant. This is a grant to support caregivers of any persons with disabilities or learning difficulties in attending training. Caregivers will receive a grant of $200 per care recipient. This grant can be utilized by attending any of the CTG approved training courses over the financial year at any VWOs and can be used by different caregivers of the same care recipient. The, 
the validity sorry of the grant is 1st April to 31st March the following year. The only payment required by the caregiver is a co-payment of just $10. However, that amount is subject to the balance of the CPG. You may go to DAS Academy website to learn more about the certificate courses, workshops and CPG we have mentioned. We look forward to seeing you soon. With this, we have come to the end of our talk today and here's wishing all of you a great weekend ahead.